Hey everyone, before we actually begin this episode, we just wanted to remind you guys to go ahead and rate us and give us five stars. This is how people find out about our podcast and also this important episode. Yes, guys. So, you know, we discuss a lot of hot topics, which impacts food, it impacts nutrition, and furthermore, we like to bring light to um, social and environmental issues that impact all communities. And spreading our message is so very important. So if you hear an episode that you like, don't just keep it to yourself. Share it with your friends and your family and rate and review that episode on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify. Yes, guys, please do so. And also, bless you, Jalen, who is our third co-host. Yes. <laughs> So hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. I'm Kim. And I'm Joanne. And today we're going to discuss the elephant in the room. The topic that is on everyone's mind and that is the coronavirus or some people call it the COVID-19 virus. Yes, so I and my family had an all expense paid, ready to go to cruise that's supposed to occur in the next couple of weeks really yeah in the next couple of weeks and it doesn't really look like we're going to make it because uh you know in our group of family that we're planning on going on this cruise we have our 99 year old grandfather 70 year old mom our aunt and uncle who are all in their 60s and all four have underlying conditions and because they are quarantining people on these ships you know the recommendation now by the government is that people who fall under the categories that my family members do fall under do not go cruising at this time you know and I have my five month old even though they say kids are not as affected I I don't know what my five month old um can or can't um withstand so I'm trying to protect my family yeah I I I hear him right now telling you that you know he's strong and he's healthy (laughs) But honestly, I don't blame you there. I mean, especially like with the whole entire quarantining people, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, those people that are off the coast of California, I think it's Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying to myself, like, man, these people have jobs to get back to. These people have so their lives to get back to. And I know I would be very upset to be stuck on a ship extremely mm-hmm. upset so we've all heard of you know the hand washing and the hand hygiene precautions to take but we want to know as dietitians how does the coronavirus impact food and nutrition right so as dietitians this is right up our alley and so because of this we've invited a third dietitian who recently came back from visiting her family in singapore and we wanted her to help us discuss this topic and to talk about food safety, micronutrient deficiencies, and basically all things that could be related to food and nutrition during uh, a scare or maybe not a scare, a situation such as this. Right. So Yi Min Tio is a certified nutrition support clinician currently based in L.A., She currently works as a clinical dietitian in both community and teaching hospitals, providing nutrition support and culturally sensitive medical nutrition therapy for patients and clients in her day-to-day work. Outside of work, she's involved with community and nonprofit efforts to spread cultural nutrition knowledge and wellness classes for the general public. Her goal is to help others reconnect and strengthen their relationship with food, culture, and health while celebrating their personal heritage. So Yi Min, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you. Glad to be here. So Yi Min, we know that recently you just came back from an international trip. Um, Let our viewers know a little bit about it. So yeah, I recently came back from Singapore. Um, just right when the COVID-19 was starting to be a threat in Asia, not so much to the U.S. So um, it was actually during the time where Chinese New Year was Mm -hmm. happening. So the whole area in Singapore where a lot of the Chinese families were celebrating, but with the virus outbreak, you know, not a lot of us were going outside. The malls were pretty empty, mm. which is kind of rare because usually those places would be bustling, hustling, especially the markets. Um, that wasn't really happening. So oh, okay. a lot of us kind of stayed at home. We vis- we still visited each other because that's a traditional practice, right? During Chinese New Year, 
Um, we go to each other's family and relatives' house and catch up, eat together. That's the biggest thing during um, the Chinese New Year season. Right. So yeah, it's been interesting to see kind of how the crowds were not there as much as how I was used to before. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that that is very in- interesting because you know this COVID nineteen. It seems it's basically a pandemic now, right. and I know everyone is taking a lot of precautions. Right. And, it, you know, it's kind of going cr- crazy. Everywhere you see on social media, people are going to, um, you know, the store and buying everything, fighting over toilet paper. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is crazy. But us on the nutrition side, I've had people, and I know you guys most likely have had people ask you questions um, and I've even seen some questions online where people are posting, asking, is there anything that we can do nutrition wise to help ourselves and whatnot? And so we're going to, you know, discuss first and foremost, what specific foods can somebody eat during any kind of um, situations such as, as this? Is there such a thing? With regards to my personal um experience back home in our family, you know, we always have the traditional practice of having um, a little bit more of the dry goods, um, non-perishable produce, canned stuff at home. Uh So that's just been a common practice. And, you know, before this virus really hit and with the festive season around the corner, um, my family usually preps like one to two weeks, you know, worth of food before because we are usually hosting friends and families. Okay. So um, with that, we are prepared in the sense is that if something does happen, if, you know, supply is low, which it's kind of nice for our government to reassure us back in Singapore is that we will, we will still have pl- um, plenty mm-hmm. of food going around. But if in any case we do have stock at home, you know, we are always ready to, you know, use things like, you know, traditional foods like dried mushroom, dried shrimp, tofu skins, um, canned sardines, um, even pork um, trotters, mm-hmm. like pork legs. So very some of the more traditional um, cheaper canned foods we usually have on stock. Right. So I know, you know, when you were speaking about your cultural dishes, I'm pretty sure that a lot of our uh, people that do listen to this podcast can identify and say, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I eat this too. I eat that too. So just to backtrack a little bit, um, define for us the d- difference between macros and micros. Yeah, so um, macros are your main um, building blocks of life. So your carbohydrates, mm. proteins, and fats. Right. So you essentially need a, um, l- relatively large amounts of these macros to grow and to be healthy. Exactly. So just to kind of break down the functions of these macros. So carbs usually um, gives you more of a short-term boost of energy. You store them in your glycogen stores to use them as well. Um, Proteins, they help build your muscles, your organs, and then your fats. So more of a longer, um, Uh longer term energy provision, you know, you store them as adipose tissue in your body as well, but it's also important for neurological health. And, And what about micros? Yeah, so uh, micros are kind of um, your essential vitamins and minerals that you need to have a healthy growth, immunity, you know, brain health, and overall your um, productivity as a person, right? So Mm -hmm. um, with the carbs, protein, and fats, these vitamins and minerals help our body to process these macronutrients more efficiently. And um, they're also involved in producing enzymes, hormones, other substances, which are important as well for these processes. So when we don't have enough of these micronutrients and macronutrients, you know, we're not functioning at our optimum level. So things like fatigue, you know, lower immunity, we get sick more easily, which long term, it could potentially lead to impaired physical and mental development, especially in kids, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also, we're not as we're not at our optimal, not productive. And sometimes when someone is experiencing severe like malnutrition, or any vitamin mineral deficiencies long term, um, there's a risk for death as well. Mm. 
So as you guys can see, we're bringing it back to nutrition basics. <laughs> right. You know, this is what you should be doing every day and not during just during times this is this. And we don't believe in fear mongering and we're not trying to get anyone to be scared. As you can hear, my our third co- co-host is making himself known. <laughs> <laughs> So we don't believe in fear mongering and we don't want people to just start going crazy, wondering what should I be doing? What should I not be doing? These are the things that you should be doing on everyday basis. That is true. So Kim and I, you know, we're, well, Kim is in Florida right now, but I grew up in Florida and we're used to preparing for hurricanes, disaster planning and whatnot. And this is kind of what this, um, you know, you can be doing in addition to your normal eating a wholesome um, diet. So we want to talk about what exact um, macros and micros you should have in stock. And I know you mean that you addressed it earlier, um, saying, you know, what you guys do back home. But for those of us living within the United States where this thing is is spreading and it's spreading rapidly, what are some um, culturally appropriate macros and micros for the general population, which is basically a melting pot? Yeah. So, um, Usually I was looking at different resources, kind of putting everything together. And I think the main takeaway for kind of disaster prepping and planning is store things that you like to eat. So okay. if that will be like your cultural foods, um, things that you le- you like to eat on a regular basis, don't take that out of the equation because you, you probably will be pretty miserable <laughs> during that <laughs> process if you don't have things that you enjoy. Um, another thing that I saw, which was important is avoiding high salt foods because that can potentially make you thirstier, Mm -hmm. which was really interesting because during, you know, when a disaster hits, I'm sure you guys probably have uh, more experience with the planning part also is that you don't, you have to consider that if your water sources, uh, water supply is limited too, right? Right. So, um, also requiring foods that require little to no cooking, if you don't have any, electricity or gas to prepare those items but also most importantly high uh, pick foods that are high in nutri- uh, nutrient value or fortified foods mm-hmm. uh, things like your enriched products um, for example if you're getting um, soy milk that's um, the ultra um, processed packaging ones that's shelf stable usually those have like fortified calcium or uh, vitamin d stuff like that so Things along those lines to meet your micronutrient needs as well, along when you're taking True. in your macros. So picking something a little bit more energy dense, you know, maximizing the calorie and protein provision with every single bite that you take. And obviously among that, some of the culturally acceptable foods. And the thing that you said earlier about stocking up on food that has minimal preparation is essential because, you know, as Joanne mentioned earlier, you know, I'm in Florida. So on top of this whole entire COVID-19, I'm also thinking about hurricane season where I'm like, okay, well, that's a double whammy right there because we're going to have this COVID-19, who knows how long it's going to last, and also possibly a lack of power. But with all of that being said, do you think, and I mean, Joanne, you can chip in on this too. What do y'all think about buying frozen or canned foods in this situation just you know knowing everything that the different states experience with natural disasters and all so at least for california i remember um back when we had a really um high amount of rainfall some of our power lines were out in certain cities so that definitely affected um you know in terms of keeping those perishable goods um fresh so I would say personally, like ha- if you have some kind of um, refrigeration space to always have a little bit of frozen products available, I agree. Um, but also canned stuff. So you have a variety of both that mm. you can use. And um, obviously, if power is out, you want to be able to use those um, frozen produce first. But however, like they needed to be heat up. And not all foods freeze well, too. And there's also an issue with like temperature control. So that was the main thing that I thought about is if someone is immunocompromised, right? If someone's, you know, they are not able, to, their immune system is not as good, they're at a higher risk for foodborne illness. 
that's definitely a consideration on my end. But yeah, I would like to hear what your guys' experience or thoughts on that too. I, I mean, I agree with you. So normally in disaster planning, you read that canned goods are the best kind of foods to store. Um, you know, in facilities that I um, go in and consult, um, I'm part of the team that makes sure that these nursing homes have foods that are needed just in case, you know, a storm comes through and shuts the power off. But in this situation, you know, we don't necessarily need to focus on getting, you know, canned goods and foods that don't need cooking because from what I'm seeing thus far and what the CDC is saying, we're not going to have an issue with power or, you know, the lack of power. Really, if someone is being quarantined or being put in their home, you just need to have access to food. So if, with that being said, I, I, I think food in general, whether it's frozen, whether it's canned, even fresh foods um, is what you just need to have a little bit extra in your house than what you normally do. You know what just popped to mind when I was listening to both your responses? You know, okay, you know, the fact that we just, we need to have food in the home and food that is appropriate for individuals that may be immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you guys think, you know, the grocery stores, like the shelves are going empty and people are fighting and like, I, I don't, I don't get it. Mm. <laughs> I honestly don't like why mm. why food all of a sudden seems to be like the hot commodity for the COVID-19 like yeah you know stock up but the quarantine time is 14 days isn't that if right. I'm not mistaken true but a lot of people they don't shop for more than a week at a time I don't shop for more than a week at a time I'm a family okay. of six I don't have refrigerator space to have like two weeks worth of fresh foods in my refrigerator. I, I I mean, I probably could laugh because I have a lot of dry goods, just like the men's culture. My culture, you know, Haitians, we got a lot of rice. So I do have a lot of rice in my pantry. But in general, I think people are just, um, you know, they're not only fighting over food, they're fighting over things like toilet paper. And I think from what I read, it's people don't know what to do and mm -hmm. they want to have something to do to prepare and so they're going after all the essentials that make them comfortable, like toilet sure. paper. Yeah, I guess it's think? also like kind of trying to gain control mm -hmm. over something that you don't mm -hmm. really have control over with this outbreak, right? That like is the right. The virus is spreading. We can do what, you know, we are supposed to do, you know, good hand hygiene, very basic things. If you're sick, don't go outside, avoid crowded places, preventing any potential transmission as much as possible to a big crowd or other people. But one thing that came to mind is also a scarcity mindset, right? Like mm. if, if routinely you are going to the grocery store like every couple of days um, or once a week to buy something because it's easy access, mm. the thought of, and you're used to it. We have like grocery stores sometimes around the corner, easy access, and you always see the abundance in, in those stores when they stock it that way. But um, when you hear about, oh, the virus is coming, and you see news about um, a lot of our imports come from China too. And when that's potentially going to be cut off, you know, people freak out. It's like, oh, what's going to happen? The next thought is to make sure that you have enough stuff at home. So that also comes with, with what you guys were talking about. It's like if people are not prepared or mm -hmm. do not plan for it too, in a realistic and practical way, then this can this can happen, which can affect the whole community as well. Mm, that is a very good point. That really is that whole entire scarcity mindset. I guess it all goes back to you know we we've, we've all read about the Great Depression and how things were tough, right? And so I'm thinking you know maybe some people do have that that lingering in the back of their minds. But speaking about that incubation period of um, 14 days. Yemen, I know you're also a um, certified nutrition support clinician. Are nutrient deficiencies real for individuals which may be on quarantine? Mm -hmm. For quarantine, well, very often we also have to look at if they have any other pre-existing conditions, right? If they have other medical conditions that might have them be more at risk for nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Very often in a clinical setting, which I'm the most familiar with, we see patients that 
get admitted, and they're people of of the general public, right? And very often, um, it's most common to see in seen in people who who went through a period of poor intake mm-hmm. for a while, and also people who had alcohol abuse. So some behaviors that can potentially deplete their micronutrient reserves or nutrient reserves in general, which causes malnutrition from there. Mm. In that sense, if someone does have um, a pre-existing condition that causes them to be at risk, that's something that we see clinically. And that's when we step in to kind of help with the repletion and making sure they're getting enough nutrition. Right. So in general, you know, I know people are thinking about this and We've heard recommendations made by the government, by the CDC, in regards to if you have medications, if you've been prescribed anything by your doctor. So this would include any kind of supplementation. Right. If you do have a pre-existing condition, this would be the time to make sure you just have, um, you know, depending on what's going on in your local surroundings, in your city, you may want to start getting an extra prescription on hand so that you may not need to go out because the recommendation right now is if you are of a certain age, over 60, and have Mm -hmm. underlying conditions, you shouldn't be roaming, you know, the streets. So I would recommend that people do do that if um, they have prescriptions for supplements or supplements have been recommended to them by their health professionals. But in general, um, in a 14-day period, which is what has been going on with the quarantine, you shouldn't become deficient in most of the vitamins and minerals that are recommended for people to consume on a daily intake. Do you guys agree with me on that? Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. Um, just as long as they don't have any like pre-existing, pre-existing. Right. Yeah, if they're like a normal, healthy adult, then yeah, everything should be gravy, good to go. Yeah, if it goes on for a longer time, that might be a concern. Right. But also thinking right. about what we're stocking up. If If someone's only eating ultra processed foods, you know, very limited variety, um, things only from a box. I see where you're going. Maybe you wouldn't be immediately deficient um, right after that incubation Mm -hmm. period of two weeks, but you're definitely at higher risk after that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joanne, like last night, me and you were speaking about the nursing homes in um, the state of Washington. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these old people that, you know, they're, they're some of them, I'm not going to say all of them, were probably not in the best of health. Like I would be concerned about a nutrient deficiency for that population. Right. So at home and in the clinical setting is totally different. Yeah. So I was speaking in regards to the home. So in a clinical setting, like the facilities I consult at, I have my um, dietary managers, they're ready with um, foods that they've purchased. And again, these foods are not even necessarily foods that they would normally purchase in a normal disaster planning setting. Mm -hmm. They're purchasing foods ahead of time on the menu that are on the menu so that they have it on hand just in case the trucks are able to deliver foods for that week. They have it. So the foods are normal, um, high nutrient density foods and they're not really lacking. So that's why I kind of feel like now what's going on in this situation. So preparedness for this situation, in my mind, is kind of different than what would occur if we were preparing for um, hurricane season in Florida, where you would lose power, you may lose, uh, you know, access to your fridge and cooking on your stove. And, you know, you may even be um, put out of your, your house. I agree. Yeah. And you know, what scares me most of all, as you said, you know, right now, we're not in the time to say like, you know, you're, we're going to lose electricity. But for me in a few short months, guys, (laughs) that may be my reality. Are you doing anything to help better prepare for both situations for your case? You know, right now, that's a great question. Yemen. Thank you for becoming the interviewer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But to be open and transparent and honest with you guys, not at this time, I'm just still like, wrapping my head around how am I going to balance these two things because of, you know, the clinical setting that I am working in. I know, Joanne, you sent me an article saying that, you know, in the nursing homes, only essential staff is allowed to come in um, Mm -hmm. to see these individuals because of the COVID-19. So I'm just like waiting, like, okay, in Florida, okay, like, what's the game plan? What are we going to do for my regional dietitian team? And I have yet to hear anything. So 
will have to tune in later on when it's actually hurricane season for you guys to know my game plan. Because right now I don't have one. I really don't. And to be honest with you guys, I'm just like in a little shell shock Mm -hmm. because I know Mm -hmm. people say, oh, you know, you're not supposed to be afraid of the virus. You don't need to buy all these extra masks and things of that nature. But it's so much uncertainty. Yeah, I think that's what's that. That is what a lot of people are right. feeling is we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't fully understand this virus, mm-hmm. how, it, you know, we know how it spreads by seeing, um, you know, community transmission and things like that. But, you know, it's not something that we can just get rid of. Mm-hmm. And I think with the rate that it's spreading to people are really concerned. Right. So it's it's diff- it's a different ballgame than what we have experienced before, like, you know, SARS or other kind of um disease Mm. so i think yeah you know being uncertain with where this is going how long it's gonna take i think that's what a lot of people are concerned about yeah and and i and i know and and it's not that i'm not concerned because i am because the unknown who wouldn't be concerned about that but i'm just preparing myself for you know if something were to happen so just in a general setting if i have four boys well, the little one is not really eating like that, but just the three of them at home all day eating, like my food will not last. Like I need food just for that purpose to be ready just for that. So I'm preparing my mindset and my, you know, my family in that sense. And it doesn't mean that you have to go crazy. It doesn't mean that you got to go fight people for food and whatnot in the grocery store. You just got to get yourself ready. And, you know, with what you said um, before, Kim, with the nursing homes, that's what we're doing because that's the population that's mainly being affected Mm -hmm. um, gravely with this virus. So, you know, CMS is shutting it down. They're like, you know, we shouldn't be letting families into the building um, you know, they're allowed to come in and visit their family member and then they exit right away. They don't go to the dining rooms. They don't go, you know, to the activity rooms and whatnot. And they're screening people as they're coming into the building also, just as they are, they're doing at the airport. So right. they're taking those precautions because of what's going on in Washington state. They don't want that repeated anywhere else in the nation. And I don't fault them for that. It is. It is. So the last question that we have, and I think we can all answer. I recently went to the grocery store and which reminds me, Eamon, you stated earlier that, you know, individuals are consuming like a lot of ultra processed foods. When I went to this grocery store, which will remain nameless, (laughs) rice was sparse, beans was sparse, water was sparse, but the chips and candy and junk food aisle, I was so surprised. At how packed right. that aisle was. <laughs> I guess it's a supply and demand thing. But going back agree. to my my question, seeing that the water was sparse, so what other beverages can we consume to ensure that we're staying hydrated? Because I know the COVID nineteen, you know, results in a fever, and you know, fever can mm-hmm. further exacerbate dehydration. So, what other beverages besides water can we give? options can we give to the general public? I think we can also think about it from a daily fluid need perspective. So Mm. we're not just getting fluids from water, you know, we get it from other other drinks like rehydration solutions or, um, you know, soups, things like that. They all contribute to um, our fluid intake for the day. Mm. You know, if someone is um, at risk, potentially at risk for dehydration you know or like kids you know we want to have some kind of not just water but um one of the recommendations we give patients to it's like an oral rehydration solution so you can make it at home or you can Uh um, buy things like you know pedialyte hydrolyte those are like some of the commercial options in situations that need it but otherwise i think water would be okay for for most people yeah i think so too i i I don't think that water is an issue because most people nowadays they have um filtered water coming through their refrigerator if push comes to shove your faucet still works yeah that's true you know you can drink from there i i wouldn't even i i don't know why people are going again you know it probably goes back to the um they want to have control over something and water is the first thing that people always think um to purchase during you know hurricane season and other kind of natural disasters so that is true oh wow 
Well, guys, I know that, you know, we've discussed a lot related to this COVID-19 virus and our whole entire attempt at doing this podcast with Emin is to basically show you guys that, you know, the whole entire fear mongering, which the news stations are popular for, that's how they make their money. The whole entire fear mongering, which is going on, I think, you know, we need to take a step back and as professionals and professionals giving the general public or those listening to this podcast advice that we need to make conscientious decisions for ourselves as well as our family members Mm -hmm. uh yimin um thank you so much for being on our podcast so if our audience wants to connect with you where can they find you on social media yeah um i'm on instagram so my handle is gonna be herbs and food so that's where you can find find me and some of the things that I post. Nice. And also Yemen's handle will be in our, um, I always want to say description box. Is it a description box? It's in the, what is it? It's, it's in our information box when you're listening to this podcast. As usual, guys, go ahead and give us five stars and also rate this podcast. That's how people know that this podcast exists. So thank you guys for listening. Until next time. Bye, guys. Hey, everyone. Bye. Bye.